Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to move forward to our last session of the day before we actually move into the CMO felicitation ceremony. This is a special address for the evening, which talks about how to build a cult following for your brand. Our speaker is the chairperson of Nully Group, a 650 crore national retail chain specializing in textiles and women's ethnic wear. The Economic Times named her as among corporate India's fastest rising women leaders. She's also been named by Forbes as Asia's Women to Watch in 2016. She is a frequent speaker at industry events and an ambassador for Government of India's innovation efforts and champions of change program. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Miss Lavanya Nali, Vice Chairperson, Nali Group of Companies. Can everybody hear me? All right, perfect. Uh, I, it's not an enviable position to be in, I think, the last session of the day, but hopefully I can do justice to that. Um, today I actually wanted to tell you three stories. I know the topic is about how to build a cult following for your brand, but I think what I would love to do is to share with you, um, I think what I would love to do is share with you three personal stories. Um, stories that are close to my heart about the family business, about our brand. And hopefully there are some lessons in there which will resonate with you. The first one actually started, um, this is set in 1950s. And I was reading, there's a Tamil magazine called Kumudam. And in that there's this writer, Ashok Mitran. Um, and he had written this beautiful story in it. And I'd read the whole of it. And when I came to the end, I realized that he was actually talking about my great-grandfather. Um, and that's a story that stuck with me. And, and the story is basically about how he came to Madras back in the 50s with his sister and his parents for the, um, for the, marriage, of his, uh, for the marriage of his elder sister. And when he had come down, I think they realized, the family had realized that the alliance was already forged with another person. And so his uh, father decided to leave the mother and the... Uh, son and the daughter behind while he went to seek another alliance. Um, and the daughter and the mother came to our store and they wanted to buy a wedding sari. Now, even back in those days, I think it's no different from today. You people save up to buy their wedding saris. It's one of the main events of a wedding. Um, but back then, the uh, woman basically came to my grandfather, uh, my great grandfather, and said, Is it okay if I pay an installment? Uh, at which point he replied saying, it's very unusual to ask to pay in installments. You typically don't pay in installments for a wedding sari. What's going on? And she said, look, we had come here with the intent of kicking off this wedding. And we had 6,000 rupees. And because it's a large sum of money, we've deposited that in the bank. And in the 50s, there was a withdrawal limit of 500 rupees per month. So we can't really pay... And I don't know what I'm going to do if the alliance actually gets fixed and if we actually have a wedding on our hands, uh, you know, uh, soon enough. And lo and behold, I think that's exactly what happened. They found an alliance and uh, there was a, uh, you know, there was an impending wedding and they didn't really have the money. Uh, they had the money, but they didn't have access to it. So my great-grandfather at that point in time, and he did not know this family. They had come in from Hyderabad. They were not from Chennai. They had no common friends. But he said, I will give you the 6,000, which back in the day was a huge sum of money. Whatever happens, the wedding must not be stalled for reasons like this. So I will give you that money so you can, um, so you can celebrate the wedding of your daughter. And even though the wedding was going to happen in Tirupati. Now, of course, they didn't default. They came back and you know, paid off and all of that. But it's a story that stuck. right? It's a story that stuck with... Ashok Mitran as a young boy, how he witnessed it. He went on to become a writer. He spoke about it. Um, and there are many stories like this that exist um, with Nalli. And the reason why I picked this out is to say, customer is the center of our world. Now, a lot of us say it, and we say, you know, we're a customer-centric brand. But if there's something that I take away from this story, 
number one, people don't want you to give them things they don't want to buy from you. I think what they want is someone who's going to help you solve their problems, whatever that is. So when we say we're a customer-centric brand, you really need to do everything for that customer. The second thing is your customers define your brand. So what we, it's one thing to say, you know, we're a consumer-centric company, we're all about the customer, we put the customer first. But does your customer say that? Is that what people talk about? When you have a chat with them and, then, and you ask someone, what's the first three things that come to your mind when you think about us as a brand? Do they actually say, look, it's, you know, I feel, um, I feel celebrated each time I come in there, I've, you know, I have a delightful experience, I really enjoy associating with your brand. If that's what they're saying about you, then clearly you've done something right. Everything else really is just, I think, a little bit of sometimes we believe in our own hype. And the last thing that I take away from this is a customer who is a fan, a customer who becomes your brand advocate, who has such an experience, and he talks, he or she talks about it. Um, and today in this day and age, you know, they're going to talk, the, the voice of the customer really is heard. They're going to be a far better brand advocate than anything that your marketing efforts can do. The second story that I have um, is also from a similar time period. Um, so some of you might recognize her from this picture, but there was this very elegant lady who walked into our store with a single strand of blue thread. And she walked up to the salesperson and said, look, I have this, this uh, strand of blue thread. Do you think you could make a sari for me in this exact color? And that was a color that was not really very common, nor was it available at that time. And so the salesperson thought about it and said, all right, let me see what I could do, and then passed it on to uh, my grandfather at the time. And he thought about it and he said, look, there's, there's only one weaver that I know in Kanjvaram who can do it, Mr. Murtu Chettiar, let's take it to him. And this gentleman was well known for his innovation in, in dyes and, you know, coming up with colors and, and uh, innovative designs and weaving techniques. And so he took it to him and after some trial and error, they actually got a sari made in that exact shade of blue. Uh, and this lady, uh, came to the store, picked it up, wore it for a Carnatic music festival, and that shade became known as MS Blue after MS Subalakshmi, because she wore it and it was so popular that everybody who basically went and saw her at that concert started coming to our store to say, okay, where do I get that? I haven't seen that shade before, and I want to get the exact same thing that she's wearing. And it became almost an industry, um, an industry term, where now people just call it MS Blue. And, the, and what I wanted to, um, what I wanted you all to take away from this story, right, is I think as a brand, know what you stand for, know what your strengths are. Our core strengths were product, innovation, value for money, right? We're not, we focus on few things and we focus on them and we do them well. What you don't do is also a very clear strategy. We do not have a loyalty program, we do not have loyalty points, we do not do a coalition. We've had no discount since 1928. And that's a, that's a strategy that works for a lot of people, to have a high-low strategy where you know, you've, got a, um, you've got a certain margin and then you have an effective margin because each time you want to drive traffic into your stores, you kind of play around with the pricing a bit, and there's nothing wrong with dynamic pricing. But for every brand, you've got to be very clear in terms of this is what we stand for, what we focus on. And for us, it is product, it is value for money, keeping your margins as lean as possible. And then nothing else that's going to add to those overheads. You're not going to have any bloated costs. You're not going to have, like, you know, you're not going to invest too much money um, in any of these other uh, benefits because you'd hope that focusing on the product, focusing on the ops, uh, focusing on those values is really going to bring those customers in the door. Um, and that's the last point, which is about being internally consistent. Uh, whatever it is that you pick, you'd want to, you want to ensure that these things reinforce each other. So I see a lot of Companies today sometimes they want to pick the best of it and say let's look at best in class But sometimes you've got to think okay, but for your brand does that resonate with your core values? Does that resonate uh, with your DNA? Are you very clear and focused in terms of what you stand for? Or are you just looking at let's you know look at the best across every function and try to sort of inculcate that sometimes that latter strategy doesn't exactly work The last and the final story that I wanted to say um, and this is a personal story so this was back in the 80s when I was a child, and I, 
lived in the ancestral home which was on top of the uh, of the Nalli flagship store. Now, if you've seen the flagship store uh, in Chennai, it's it's one of those strange buildings that um, that looks very small, but then you go into it and it sort of just opens out into this cave of wonders. Um, but we had our ancestral home, which was built in the 1920s, and my grandmother and my grandfather still live there now. And I grew up there as a child, and I spent my first five years there. And in the 80s, I remember, you'd always find a line of people standing outside, um, just outside our store. And I used to think, wow, this is, you know, this is so exciting that there's so many people who want to come and shop at our store. But they were always men, and so once I asked my grandfather, you know, why, uh, this, uh, who are all these people, and they, you know, they all come here and they stand in this line. And he said, they're all looking for jobs. Um, and I thought, wow, so India has so many salesmen. And he said, no, we are lawyers and doctors and engineers, and they're looking for jobs because we don't have any jobs in this country. Now, that made an impression on me. And that's something that stuck with me because after that, I think I started to see how my grandfather and after that my father and how we even till today, um, how we run the family business. For us, the employees are an extension of your family. So you would, we would take care of our employees because once you're part of our fold, you know, we, you're part of it. Um, and back in the 80s, I think when times were tough, we had, um, the, you know, the family business, uh, or business families typically became more than just business entities. So if you had an employee who's done good work, has been with you, has been loyal, um, is going through, is, is uh, you know, it's time for him to get married, um, he needs a loan, you almost became a bank. You know, uh, if you had someone who was going through some kind of a medical emergency, as an employer, you would be the first person that they would turn to. And so these were the formative sort of experiences that I grew up seeing. And the result of that, the impact of that, if you look at us as a business, most companies in the retail sector, with salespeople especially, if you see the attrition and the average tenure, the average tenure tends to be, in a matter of months, right, quite low. Quite low. Um, salespeople generally tend to have a lot of turnover. If you go to our flagship store, the average tenure is eight years. That's, that's average, which means half of them are actually have lasted with us much longer than that. And I think that's the kind of loyalty that you can't buy, that policy can't sort of, you know, incentivize. It's something that you've got to live your values and you've got to have that sort of purpose. The same, and the same uh, philosophy that we have towards our employees extends to our weavers and extends to the larger community that we work with. Um, and a lot of the initiatives that we've done to sort of work alongside them over the years. And that's why we, till today, have a lot of weavers who worked with us for multiple generations um, and who worked with us almost exclusively and uh, even though they're, you know, they're, they're not obligated to, but we buy up their entire production capacity, we work with them almost like they're a captive unit. And so the final um, takeaway from that is, uh, is to, as a brand, be authentic, have purpose. And I think what you find is when you're driven by that kind of a powerful ethos, people are attracted to it. And by people, I don't mean just customers, but I mean people, humans, all of us, right? We, all we want is to belong. All we want is to find meaning, right? Whether you're an employee, whether you're a customer, right? Um, and if you have, if you've built a brand that lives its values, that will come across. And I think that will come across to customers, it will come across to employees, and you're going to have a very engaged um, and a very sort of appealing experience. And the way to do that is not really through tactics or through policies or through you know, these sort of incremental shifts. But I think go deeper and really think about what, are, what is my brand DNA? What are my brand core values? And it shouldn't be something that you put up on the wall. It should be something that you live and emulate every day. And it starts from the top. It starts from the senior team all the way down to the frontline person who's empowered to actually, um, to, actually, uh, to, to actually act on what it is that you put up as your core values. So the final thing, so I've given you the three stories and my sort of what I've taken away from that, right? And, and I believe that these, as simplistic as they sound, these are... Um, what I genuinely believe has gone into making our brand 
have that kind of iconic status and have that kind of cult following. We've always been about go beyond the call of business when it comes to your customers. Go beyond the call of duty when it comes to your employees. Be completely focused, know what you stand for, and be absolutely number one on that. Do not compromise on what your strengths are and forget about what everybody else is doing. And I think having that kind of focus has really helped us uh, quite a bit. And if you ask what the impact is, I'd say, if you look at the Saudi industry, it's a 70, depending on the reports that you look at, 70,000 70, to 85,000 crore industry, highly fragmented. There's not even one Saudi player that has cracked even 1% of market share. Um, highly regional tastes. So it's very difficult when you have such a large industry and then the, the products are going to be so localized and you need to customize it to every region. Um, the average price, this is for a, for a silk sari, but the average price is around 6,000 to 8,000, so that's not a very, that's not an insignificant amount of money. Um, and some brands spend hundreds of crores in marketing. Um, I won't get into which ones, but I think uh, uh, there are different ways of sort of, you know, trying to reach out and get that awareness, and one of it is really to spend a lot uh, on marketing. But we've stayed true to our values, we've stayed true to what we've done, right, to our way of doing business. And what you can see in terms of the results is um, today we are a 700 crore business. Um, we are the only national player in the, uh, in the Saudi industry. We're a category killer in Saudis, which means that if you, a lot of people think that, okay, then they're a silk brand or they're a wedding silk brand. Uh, but if you look at our collections in Mumbai, or you look at the collections in Calcutta, or you look at the ones in Delhi, you'd see that it's very customized uh, to the local tastes, um, which means that we have not only the access to that kind of an inventory, but we also really bring that out to the, fort, uh, to the forte uh, with our stores. Despite having such a high average price, you see a high repeat purchase, and we spend barely anything on marketing. We haven't done a TVC in years. Most of this is really communicated and, and it continues to thrive through uh, word of mouth. So the last sort of, um, uh, I guess the last, my parting thought or things that I would like to leave people behind with is there's a lot of information out there about how do you build a cult brand and there's many different ways to skin a cat, right? You'll ultimately find something that resonates with your brand, with your values and and there's no real right or wrong way. But I can share with you a little bit of what worked for us. Um, what worked for us to get to this stage as an organization is just focusing on our product, our operations, right? So we focus on having an unparalleled range. We want to get the, the largest variety, the, the biggest sort of um, products out there, the best sort of designs, and, and at an unbeatable price. And to do that, we've got to focus on our operations to say, okay, keep costs as low as possible. If you want to give them, if you want to give your products, uh, if you want to give your customers that kind of a range at that lower cost, you can't have so much overheads, which is either going to come through marketing or through, you know, any number of sort of business decisions that you take. So we look at it ruthlessly to say, what can we prune away? And let's stay true to what our core is and what we are known for. Um, we also focus on just-in-time inventory, which is, very, very difficult to pull off in the apparel industry, but every single day we do merchandising, every single day we get new stock in, right? And the reason is customers, especially women, they always want to see something new, right? And that's a very, um, and that's an insight that I don't think anybody here is going to debate. Um, so women always want to see something new, and the other thing is they always want to see something different. So you want to make sure that you've got new, but not only new and unique designs, but distinct designs. Because if she sees that you've got two saris of that same type, she's not going to pick it up because she doesn't want to buy a sari that somebody else might be wearing, you know, at some other point in time. Um, and, the, and the final thing is, I think, underpinning all of this is um, our strategy or sort of our business decisions. Uh, the way we've made it work is by having a lot of autonomy for all of our store, for, um, have, uh, providing a lot of autonomy to our uh, store managers and our regional heads. So we've got some business decisions that we've taken. Like we don't provide, we don't give any discounts. We haven't given discounts since, um, since you know, 1928. But if you tell someone as a store manager, you do not have the lever of manipulating price. You cannot provide a discount in order for you to offload inventory. 
then how do you expect him to actually, you know, perform? So then what we do is we say, all right, we're going to give you complete autonomy when it comes to your product. Don't focus on, don't think of discounting and don't think of manipulating your price as a way for getting customers in or as a way for you to offload stock. Focus on getting the best product possible. And we give you complete autonomy and we're not going to sit here centrally doing the merchandising for you, right? But you, but you decide. All we look at is your, you know, your top line and your bottom line. So they are extremely empowered. And the same holds true for our frontline salespeople. They're part of our merchandising decisions every day, um, where they actually come in to the merchandising room and they look at it and they say, look, this, these products are going a little slow. I would say pare down on that. You know, let's not get so much of this particular type of motive because I don't think it's really doing too well. And so those, I think having that kind of an engaged and empowered workforce um, is really critical for you to be able to do these two other things. But the thing that really takes it to another level, I think, is how you work with everybody else along, along the chain. Because your business is not just everyone that's internal, everyone that's on your payroll. But your customers also define your brand, what they feel about it, how, how they walk away um, feeling about it, what they associate with the brand. Uh, the folks who sort of help you on the journey, the weavers, uh, whoever it is, your suppliers, right? And finally, of course, your employees, because they're the first person that your customers are going to see and the last person that they greet before they get into their car. And so that's one thing that I could um, sort of leave behind. I'd, I'd probably say focus on, I guess, what your brand's DNA is, what your core values is. And a lot of us here are in positions of influence and power. Um, and I'd say at every level, there are ways where we could emulate these values. And I think ultimately that's what makes the difference between are you going to be a good brand or really are you going to be something that's, that's an iconic brand that's, that's going to endure. Okay, I think we're right up on time. Uh, if we have any, uh, so that's it from me for the presentation. <laughs> If we have any questions, I can perhaps do, uh, do a couple. We can probably take one quick question if we have. OK. Gentlemen here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I understand is uh, you basically like operate through your uh, retail uh, shops, your uh, company-owned uh, uh, shops. You don't have a franchisee system, or you don't have a digital reach to the customers. So, how do you, you know, plan yourself uh, in the next five years? So, no, we do not have a franchisee model, but we do have an Ali.com. Uh, so, it is available, and we ship worldwide. So, that's one way in which we are able to tap into segments that uh, into areas where we don't have a physical presence, and that's. Today, we don't retail on any other platform, and that's a very conscious strategic choice because I think it's still nascent. I think e-commerce, especially for a high-value segment like this, is still very, very nascent. Um, our brand and our brand ethos and our customers, I think, are such that they would uh, prefer to probably buy direct from us, as, and, and I, don't, I think we're really at odds with... Uh, listing on any of the platforms. But I do want to make it clear that we do exist uh, for anyone who doesn't have a physical store nearby. Apart from that, I think, look, the, the way to expand and grow as an organization is really, as long as there is demand, you've got to capitalize on it. There is a lot of demand. We haven't even scratched the surface of it. We've got 34 stores, but there is no way that I can say, like I said, you've seen the numbers. It's 700 crores out of what, a 70,000, 85,000 crore industry. We've nowhere scratched the surface of what is possible. And that's going to happen through um, any number of ways. Of course, there will be opportunities for offline store expansion, but today's customer, um, and someone said this quite, quite nicely to me, and they said, in India, every five years is a generational change. And I think I sort of agree with that. And, and luckily, my entire team who works with me are all born in the 90s, so, so I don't feel that, you know, I don't feel that I'm left behind thanks to them. Um, 
But today's customer is much more tech savvy, is much more vocal, um, is, you know, is, knows their mind much more clearly, right? And they engage with, technology is just a medium, and they engage with that medium in whatever way, right, to sort of communicate with the brands and to sort of express themselves and so on. I don't think e-commerce today as it exists is really the most evolved state. I don't think it is the steady state or the end state. I think it is still something in progress. But I certainly think going forward, that growth and that expansion is going to come through a combination of offline stores with certainly some level of omnichannel um, integration. Maybe if there's one more question. Would you like to? Sure. You mentioned uh, you empower your entire team uh, and you give them a lot of autonomy, particularly your store staff. So can you tell me what kind of autonomy would you empower them with? So stores, like I said, at the if you start from the head, right, from the people who make merchandising decisions. Now, typically, if you look at any kind of an apparel uh, brand, you'll have a merchandising function, then you'll have a sales function, then you'll have a marketing function, you'll have like multiple sort of functions. You may have a projects team and so on and so forth. Typically, what happens is the sales, even at a store head level, um, he inherits the merchandise and then he's given a few levers that he can employ in order to achieve his targets. Even the targets and all of that, most of the time he inherits. Now in our case, we don't give them, um, and this may sound strange to you, but we don't give our um, store heads any targets. We basically tell them, look, it's yours. It's, uh, it's your store. Our regional heads, the way that they work, they understand, and we've, uh, so, so let me back up a little bit. As an organization, we are a completely 100% privately held, privately owned organization. And we're fairly conservative on debt. So what that means is all of the expansion that we have done, how we have achieved 700 crores, has been completely through the internal generation of funds. No VC money, no PE money, no external capital. And because of that, what it does is it puts a strong um, pressure on people to be very, very operationally efficient. Um, so most of our stores, they break even within the first year, and then they start generating funds towards the corpus for expansion within year two. And so a regional um, head really, and, and most regional heads, most PNL people are that way, right? He's, he's really looking at it in terms of, okay, how much demand is there in my region? Let me put up this store. And now, it's, now that I put up this one store, I'm getting the returns from it. So with this, let me go to the head office and say, look, I've, I'm adding to your corpus, and I see that there's demand for another store in this area. So why don't you all back me up, right? And we say, great, you, you've done the work and you've come to me with the business plan. All you need is the capital and we're going to be like behind you 100%. There's no central team that does that and pushes it down, right? All of this is really coming from the people on the ground, from someone who is there saying, I get customers walking into my store every day saying, why don't you have a store in this location? I have to travel all the way here. From there to the folks who actually look at, uh, who look at the sales of that store, right? which is that particular store head. So we tell them, look, you have complete control over merchandise. Now, it's very, very difficult. Um, it sounds easy, but if you actually think about it, most people, if you tell them, in your business, can you give the store head complete control over merchandise? They say, no, 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 he's going to make a mistake. You know, I would rather put some guardrails and tell him, no, you need to have certain, you know, things in place. We don't actually do that. So we tell him it's completely up to you. The only thing is I want you to protect the brand, protect the reputation of the brand. We stand for certain things, and I want you to uphold that and ensure that we are competitive, right? Top line, bottom line, all of that is your targets. You, I mean, all of that is your responsibility. So you do what you need to do because you, we, we know that we don't give you any, we don't give you any marketing and we don't give you any... Uh, you know, uh, provision for discounts. So you've got to give them some way of, um, you know, some way of solving that. So that's how it kind of gets empowered at every level, where we look at it and we say, okay, what can we do to ensure that your employees are actually running this business for you, right? 
And if you do that, I think the strong employees will actually bubble up to the surface, and in the end, they will be the ones that really run your brand. Thank you very much, Ms. Nali. Well, that's all the time we have, ladies and gentlemen. Can we have Thank a huge round of applause? I'd like to request Mr. Ajit Nair, National Head Advertising Sales, Lokmat Group, to kindly join me on stage to present a token of our gratitude to Ms. Nali. I'm requesting the